Yeah, no, I was sleeping too. So you gotta have coffee. Uh-huh. So this is actually lecture nine one, <clears throat> uh, but it says nine three. It probably says it in your notes too. Poles and zeros, two important types of objects defined from a transfer function h can be used to characterize a system's behavior. They're called poles and zeros. So the definition of poles. Let a system have transfer function h. Its poles are values of s for which the magnitude of h goes to infinity. So if you plug in an s and you get back infinity, you are at a pole. That value of s was a pole that you put in. So uh, a, trans a transfer function written as a ratio has poles wherever the denominator is 0. That is for which the denominator of h of s equals 0. So this is the equation that you'll use to find poles. Take the denominator of the transfer function, set it equal to 0 and solve for the values of s for which that's true. So there you go. That's how you find the poles. Let a system have transfer function h. Its zeros are values of s for which the magnitude goes to 0. Aptly named those zeros. So a transfer function written as a ratio has zeros wherever the numerator is 0, that is s for which the numerator of h of s is equal to 0. So if you want to find the zeros, this is your equation for that. Given the transfer function h with n poles pi and nu 0 zj, we can write for some constant k that h of s is that constant k times this big fraction. You guys remember the, the big, uh, that looks like a musical note, the big pi, the product symbol? Um, from j equals 1 to nu, right, I paired the nu with j, yeah, uh, of s minus z j divided by the product of i equals 1 to n of s minus pi. So it makes sense, right? If you plug a 0 in, if you plug z j in to this for s, it's going to be zj minus zj, and you get 0. So that's where there will be a 0. If you plug in a pole, say like p3, into this then at for s, then p3 minus p3 will be 0, and the denominator will go to 0, and the, new, and the fraction will go to infinity. So we've got this um, ratio of terms that pr are the product of a bunch of uh, uh, s minus zeros divided by a product of a bunch of s minus poles. You need to have a constant out front um, that's usually non-unity for a given transfer function uh, as well. But this actually defines a transfer function fully. So like if you know the zeros and the poles, then you have this, this uh, and you know what the gain is, this k out here. Sometimes it's called the gain. Um, then you know what the whole transfer function is. That's why they're so important. Or I, mean, I guess that's one way to express why they're so important. So k um, is, there, there are some confusing terms. There is a term called the DC gain or the zero frequency gain. That is different than this gain. This gain is sometimes called the transfer function gain. Um, sometimes called the rational something gain. Um, there are some different terms for it. One of my favorites is to just use something from the 
uh, the vernacular that we're getting used to now because of MATLAB's dominance in this area of using of doing analysis. This I like to think of as being the ZPK gain. There's not a good term for this gain, the zero frequency gain or the DC gain uh, for a um, transfer function is really well defined and it's, it has a long pedigree of being described this way. Uh, in MATLAB, if you're going to use the ZPK function, which remember when we did uh, the SS function and we plugged in A, B, C, and D matrices? And that gave us back some MATLAB representation um, of a system, right? We said something like sys equals that, and then we did like simulations based on that. Some, you can do something similar uh, with a transfer function. And the syntax there is you have to put in the polynomial coefficients of your numerator. Um, so say your transfer function, let's just do a little example one, was s plus 3 divided by um, s squared plus uh, 2s plus 4. Five, okay. Uh, you put in the numerator coefficients here, so one, three, from one, three, and then you put in the denominator coefficients, one, two, five, one, two, five. I probably should have put a comma there, um, and that will define a very similar type of object in MATLAB, and you can simulate the system in a, in a very similar way to how you can do it with the state space model. A third way to do it is to use ZPK. And with ZPK, you give it a list of the zeros. So in this example, um, let's, let's edit this example. Um, well, let's not. But let's just let, let's just come up with another one, I guess. S plus three divided by, and let's just do. Um, there's a three out here. It's in this. It's in this form of this transfer function with the zeros and the poles. So we've got uh, S uh, plus two and s um, plus 8, something like that. Um, and then instead of making that 3, let's make it 4. So ZPK, uh, you give it a list of zeros. So negative 3 is a 0, right? And then you give it uh, a list of the poles. So negative 2 and negative 8. Then you got to give it that gain, the ZPK gain, which is four. And these two are very equivalent. The, the transfer function or the ZPK model, they're very, very similar. It's a little bit different than the state space model, um, but they are very similar. You can do a lot of things with all three of them, like you can do LSIM simulations, you can do step simulations. You can have it do a pole zero map and all kinds of good stuff. So these are the these are the different uh, ways that we now know how to put system models into MATLAB, and then we can go off and do cool simulation and other analysis with MATLAB. Um, that's why I call it the ZPK gain because that's the gain that it's defined to put it into the ZPK function. All right, <clears throat> poles and zeros can define a single input, single output system, CISO systems, dynamic model within a constant, like, like we showed here. Uh, recall that even for multiple input, multiple output state space models, the denominator of every transfer function is the corresponding system's characteristic equation. 
the roots of which dominate the system's response and are equal to its eigenvalues. Wow, there's a lot of equivalencies there. So it is, not, it is now time to observe a crucial identity. So remember back in uh, chapter, was it chapter eight? A preceding chapter to this. Uh, we identified that the eigenvalues of a system are equal to the roots of the characteristic equation. Well, turns out that the poles are equal to the eigenvalues or equal to the roots of the characteristic equation. So the poles that we discussed up here are, uh, this equation is going to give us the poles. It's also going to give us the eigenvalues if we had a state space representation of the same system. Um, and uh, it also gets so the eigenvalues of the A matrix, right? Uh, it's implied. And then um, the, also the, the characteristic equation roots. All of them come down to the same expression, okay? Um, the same <clears throat> equality where you have to find the roots of this characteristic equation. So, um, therefore, everything we know about a system's eigenvalues and characteristic equation roots is true for a system's poles. This includes that they characterize a system's response, especially its free response, and its stability. So we are able to copy and paste everything we know about eigenvalues, and we copy and paste everything we know about eigenvalues from everything we learned about roots of the characteristic equation. So uh, we've got three different ways of finding the same quantities. So we've had the, the different system representations. The IO ODE representation, this gave us the, the roots of the characteristic equation, right? And the uh, uh, state space model gave us the eigenvalues of the A matrix. And the, now the transfer function gives us the um, poles. We've discovered that they're all the same. So no matter which representation you're using, when you find these different quantities, you're finding them in all of them, all of the different representations, which is pretty cool. OK, so let's, let's think about the system in terms of poles and zeros and um, try to start to interpret systems in this way now, uh, in a sort of a, uh, from a new perspective, looking at it in terms of poles and zeros. Although in some ways, we're not, le we're not learning anything new. We've, we're just porting things from before onto this new stuff. The complex valued poles and zeros dominate system behavior via their values and value relationships. Often, we construct a pole zero plot a plot in the complex plane of a system's poles and zeros, such th as that of figure 9-1. So here I plotted several poles and several zeros. Um, could be part of one system. Could have all those poles and all those zeros. That would be a massive system. But uh, yeah, it would have, the, remember, the order of the system is equal to the number of eigenvalues in the system. And so that's equal to the number of poles. So this is a one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, a ninth order system. Pretty hefty um, if we were to think that was one system. And it also has zeros, which don't contribute to the order of the system. Um, the poles are the, are the more dominant of the two in terms of what to th think about in terms of what the response is going to look like. The poles govern stability for instance. Um, so we're going to have uh, uh, some poles that have imaginary parts and real parts that are non-negative. Others are going to have imaginary and uh, uh, no real part. And some of them are going to have real parts, no imaginary part. 
Um, so remember, we're looking at these in the complex plane. Um, sometimes this is also called the uh, S plane because we're thinking of the Laplace transform S. So we can plot them. Since they're complex numbers, the real parts, the x, the imaginary parts, the y, and go from there. So uh, it'll become clear as we proceed why these maps are interesting. Um, for now, we know that anything that happens over here in the left half plane has a negative real part associated with it, right? Everything in the right half plane has a positive real part associated with it. And everything on the imaginary axis has zero real part associated with it. So we're going to have some stability understanding based on the pole zero plot. There are some other things that you can learn too. So from our identification of poles and eigenvalue, or with eigenvalues and roots of the characteristic equation, we can recognize that each pole contributes an exponential response that oscillates if it is complex. There are three stability contribution possibilities for each pole PI. If it's negative, then a stable decaying contribution is contributed to the system. So which of these are stable poles? The ones on the left, the three that are over here, right? Okay, because uh, they have negative real parts. If the real part is zero, we have marginal stability, neither decaying nor growing contribution. So these three on the imaginary axis have zero real parts, so they're marginally stable, which means that if they're perturbed from uh, uh, a point of, of uh, equilibrium, then they will they will not return to equilibrium, but they'll not fly off to infinity either, which is what an unstable contribution, if a pole has a positive real part, will do. So these three here have positive real parts, and they all are, are unstable. It's, of course, important to remember that uh, even one pole being unstable means the system is unstable. So it only takes one fly to ruin the ointment, or one figgy to ruin the pudding? I'm not sure. That's, no, there's figgy pudding. Uh, has anybody ever had that before? It's like British, I think. Figgy pudding? Is it? I, like, I don't know what it is. Yeah, it's like in Christmas songs. It's like... It like shows up in Christmas songs that we sing every year, and I'm pretty sure nobody knows what it means. It was in, um, it really? It could have originated there. <laughs> really? Mm, I imagine it being like, like, tapioca like, and then it's like a nice like crust on it from baking it it's from england from the 16th century yeah i mean supposedly the english don't make good food so i don't know <laughs> maybe it's <laughs> maybe it sucks <laughs> i don't know really a figgy pudding i want some it seems like a good day for figgy pudding not so this mm. is a fancy one, but it's still... I don't know if you can see it. It's like, it doesn't look wrapped in like a cup of Yeah, that looks like very figgy. Like, I was hoping it was more of a hint of fig. It looks like it has raisins in it. Yeah, it's getting worse. <laughs> I mean, I don't dislike raisins, but like, figs are already pretty raisiny. You add raisins to it, it'll just be like, that's a lot. That's a lot going on there. Okay, uh, great. So these different contributions um, are explored in this figure. So this is an interesting figure to which I, I recommend you uh, uh, return uh, every once in a while to get to to keep this in your memory because it's going to help. It's going to help you when you are designing systems and when you're uh, analyzing systems to see what they do. So. They're kind of uh, the pole location contribution. Um, you can think of it as as the real axis contributing 
stability considerations, okay? So the main thing that the real axis is doing is, is that the real part of the pole is telling you, is this stable or not, right? Is it in the left half plane? So it's negative real part, so it's stable. Or is it unstable? Or is it marginally stable? That's the first thing. But notice that the, so what these little boxes are, are these little inlays of free responses, where we start off at some initial condition, and we let the systems go, and we see what the response looks like. So one thing that you'll notice is, um, I mean, the, the oscillation is very obvious, but we'll come back to the oscillation in a moment. But you'll notice that out here, the decay happens pretty quickly. Okay, whereas here it's a little slower, and then here it's slower, and then if you get all the way to the axis, which that one is, there's no decay at all. Okay, and then if you go to the other side of it, you have a decay that grows, um, and that one's more slow. This one's faster, a decay that grows faster. Um, so this is a, um, a faster growth exponential, this is a faster decay exponential. Um, in between, and they're slower, okay? So this real axis governs that. So that's actually why a stable pole that's way to the left has a very negative real part out here. We'll often ignore these. We'll, we'll say if a system's got like, if it's like fifth order system, but three of the poles are way out here, and two of them are in here, uh, we'll often say, well, it's going to pretty much behave like a second order system because these poles that are way out here, they decay very rapidly. So we don't have to, they don't stick around long enough to have much contribution. So um, that's when the concept of dominant poles will come in. So we're going to revisit that uh, and we get to the, to the controls part, part of the class. But I, I want to start to get us thinking like that now. Um, the real axis is governing the speed at which the, the response is decaying to its new value. Um, and it also, or never coming back, and how fast it goes off to infinity, um, and stability. The imaginary axis is all about oscillations. So if you have a complex um, pole here, you're going to get an oscillation that occurs, uh, even though it gets damped out pretty, pretty quickly. Um, now, that oscillation is not going to be there when you're on the real axis, okay? So if you have a pole on the real axis, this is just going to have a nice real decay to zero. So off the axis, so imaginary parts non-zero, we're going to get, we're gonna get uh, an oscillation. If it's on the axis, we won't. And once you get in here, you see, okay, there's, there are a lot of oscillations happening. Here you get um, uh, oscillation that's happening, and it's never damping. Now, what's interesting about this is, is as you move up the axis, you can kind of see this here. As you move up the axis, um, this frequency is, is smaller than this frequency. This is a higher frequency signal, right? So as you, if you were to take this pole and you move it up the axis, imaginary axis away, it still oscillates without decay, but it just has a different frequency at which it oscillates. And yeah. So it increases as it goes up? The, uh, increases the frequency as it goes up, yeah. And then down here at the origin, this is, I didn't put this in there, but this one's kind of interesting too. Um, it's a very unique point, but if you start this at an initial condition, it just stays wherever it is. It just never, it just never moves. Yeah. Everywhere else on the imaginary axis, they'll oscillate forever. But if you're on the origin, there's zero frequency and it just stays steady. Okay, very good. And where were we? Okay, yeah.
Okay, I already mentioned that. And oh, something that we might not have noticed, but is the case, and I don't go into a proof of it, but uh, every time a pole or a zero wanders off the, the real axis, uh, and there's an imaginary part that's non-zero, that is going to have a reflected pair on the other side. So, so there's always symmetry about the real axis. There's a mirror image of it. So every, every complex pole and every complex zero uh, uh, shows up as a, as a pair, okay? Complex conjugate pair. And that just is due to, I mean, the polynomial equations that we solve to find the poles um, mathematically are required to have um, pairs show up. There's no way we can get any any asymmetrical um, asymmetricity, asymmetricness about the real axis. I don't know what the correct adjective is. Um, okay. Second order systems. Are we there? Yes, we are. So, second order systems, we harp on them a lot. And, and I, um, uh, I don't want you to imagine that most systems are second order or something like that. But, given what we just argued a moment ago, if you have a higher order system, we can often approximate it as being a lower order system because it has dominant poles that are down here and the other poles are way out here. It also will be uh, convenient because second order systems are kind of the maybe some of the last uh, solutions that are easy to work with analytically because they just get more and more um, messy as you go up in order. So we can solve for them, but they don't look as nice. So we learn a lot from second order systems while we're here. And uh, remember that second order systems responses are characterized by a damping ratio, zeta, and a natural frequency, omega n. These parameters have clear, complex, plain, geometric interpretations as shown in the figure. So you can almost think of this as being like polar coordinates. So the uh, lines of constant frequency are actually circles about the origin. So the radius of the circle is the natural frequency. So if you have a pole that lies, a complex conjugate pole pair, remember they have to show up in pairs. So I'm only showing the top half, but if there's one up there, there's got to be one down here too, right? but I'm just showing this one quadrant. Um, if you've got a pole on, uh, uh, in this location, then actually the, the distance from the origin to that pole is the natural frequency, if it's a second order system. Which is, so it's like a, the radius is the, is the um, like the, the, the radial coordinate is the natural frequency. And you can kind of say that the damping ratio is the angular coordinate, uh, except that it's very nonlinear, the relationship. So theta, the angle here, is the arc cosine of zeta. So it's not linear. But when uh, zeta is equal to 0, as we know, we get um, oscillation without damping. Um, and as you increase damping, um, we're going to go, if you wanted to increase damping but keep the natural frequency the same, we would go along this arc. And that's what we're describing here. If you get, so if you keep going along the arc, the damping is going to increase, but the frequency will stay the same. So this oscillation that we see in all of these locations along the circle, um, that frequency stays the same, but we're, we're uh, uh, I guess, moving along and, and damping out faster and faster, right? So we get down here, finally, we have zeta equals 1, and we've got 
critical damping, right? Remember we called that critical damping before. Oscillation stops at that point. And we then have real poles on the axis, which just decay simply and they don't oscillate. So that's zeta greater than one or overdamped. So this is the, so what we've called this before is underdamped. So under damped, critically damped. And then overdamped. So that's our that's our geometric interpretation of the natural frequency and damping ratio for a second order system. Okay. Any questions? All right. See you next week.